come from Guringo Design Studio here in Stockholm. We work uh, mainly with experience design and innovations within the textile industry, always with the ambition to uh, speed up the transformation towards a uh, circular society. Uh, I will talk a bit uh, with you. I know you're hungry, I know you're tired, so uh, I will try to keep this short, uh, but it is also a perfect state to be in for this presentation because it keeps you on your toes and uh, I know you're alive. So I will talk a bit about designing to die and how clothes that deteriorate can raise existential questions. I will talk a bit about the transformation of the word quality. I will, will give you a uh, kind of proof of concept idea, but we being the Stream Materia brand. Uh, and I will also touch on the subject of life and death, uh, both metaphorically, but also in a highly real sense. So, uh, there is a, a, a something called about to happen that is a dramaturgical state uh, that is being used in journalism and in storytelling to create emotional attachment to an issue. Um, or a story. Uh, I think most of us remember the, the image of the Vietnamese man being shot in the head in the street of Vietnam by a US Army officer back in the Vietnam War. That's a good example of about to happen. We know this man is going to die, he's going to fall down. It's in the very minute that he's being shot. So that's create a, like, an emotional attachment of the viewer seeing. That's why that made, made the news so much. It's a spectacular shot also. Uh, it's irreversible, it's inevitable what's going to happen. Um, here's another example, this is images, these are two images from the great movie uh, The Darjeeling Limited by Wes Anderson, many years ago now I think. Uh, it's a story about three brothers embarking on a journey on a train to meet their mother and they, uh, it's something, it's, always, it's the about to happen state is going, like that's the narrative of the story. But they also meet a lot of challenges on the way, creating bonds and stuff, but they have to meet the challenges because they know they can't avoid them. They just have to deal with them. Then we have the character of Bill Murray. He, uh, Adrian Brody's character is one of the brothers. He makes the train, he makes the story. We have Bill Murray's character. He doesn't make the train. He's left on the platform. He's still in the movie, but he is peripheral, always not taking part of the story or the action. Uh, it's kind of metaphorical for, for the business. Uh, here is a picture. I used to shoot this kind of stuff. I was a fashion photographer for 15 years to illustrate uh, consumption and pair this image with the four Celsius degree we see in the bottom left corner. I show you this because I think it's necessary to remember that we are sitting here with like a wall of fire coming towards us and we have the focus on return of investment. We have, we are, we're touched on the subject of risk and being safe in terms of capital and investments. I think we should focus on what can we do for, for, for the climate rather than what can the climate do for our communication. So the four degree we see here, this is Johan Rockström, who is now being uh, working at the Climate Institute of Potsdam, who told us recently that all m climate models we see are aiming for the 1.5 degrees Celsius increase in climate change. We don't have any models for this. And every model we have show us this. So he, he urged scientists to be brave enough to do models for this. And this is, an, as he said it, an end game for humanity. So we also need to look upon our models, business models, production models, consumer behaviors, and be bold enough to change these from the very beginning. And me as a designer, 80%, it is said, from 80% uh, from, uh, of the climate impact during a pro pro product's lifespan is created in the design phase. So if we continue to design clothes in this matter based on what we did 100 years ago and expect them to be what they were 100 years ago, not very much is changing in my view. Well, we're doing a great job, but it's going slow and we need to look at alternatives. So. 
Let me take you back eight years. This is going to be a figure 2012. It's a misprint. It's going to be 2014. Uh, eight years ago, I was in a meeting at a place called Inventia. It's, it's uh, now RISE, but it was it still is a research institute for the Swedish cellulose industry. I was sitting in an office with a scientist called Mikael Lindström, a, a brilliant man, and we were talking in another project, in another, another topic about what we can do with bioplastic. And he told me then, just off that project, that he had received a year before, before two bioplastic bags filled with stuff, and he forgot about them. And then two weeks before I met him, he took them up because he was changing his office. He took them up, lifted them up, and they just pulverized. They vanished into thin air. They had dried during that year. And then I remember asking him, but because I come from fashion, and I also we had started working with sustainability, I asked him, but Mikael, does that mean that we actually can make clothes that grows old on our bodies? And for me, that was like a, a no-brainer for a fashion story. Um, but also, we were going like, he was going like, yeah, maybe we could. Then we kind of had to work with, go back to the topic we were on. But that idea stayed. I'm going to drink some water. Stayed with me. <clears throat> and a couple of days later, or a week, or whatever, I stepped on this leaf. It's not a great picture, but it's a great leaf. Uh, and I got the idea about... Uh, it brought me back to the mindset of these clothes. And it, started me, started, it got me thinking about the, the beauty of the, of the, of the um, uh, volatile, you can say, of, of, of the uh, transient in a leaf. Uh, and it also got me thinking that consumption is not really a bad thing. I know we have said here that fast fashion, we, we, can't, we can't indulge in fast fashion, we can't indulge in consumption. But really, in a circular system like the forest, that is based on consumption. You know, if, if, it, if it weren't for the forest consuming life, it wouldn't exist. And a circular system, in its true form, like in sustainability as it should be, it is momentum. We come from like 150 years of industrialism being programmed with that quality is something that lasts long. It's diamonds, gold, marble, everything is like, we need to keep this. That's value for us. Not necessarily so value for the biosphere, you know, the, the planet. Uh, so in, an, in a circular system like the forest, Everything has momentum. It's growing or it's dying. Permanent state status quo that we all strive for is not something we can have in a circular system. We're just using stuff and creating artificial loops. Not just, sorry. We're creating artificial loops, and that is great within this paradigm. But we need also to find alternatives and rethink it from the beginning to create stuff that grows and dies and have momentum to become circular. Uh, this brought me into uh, writing a manifest, a design manifest, and making a fashion story, shooting a fashion story for the magazine Form. And this is 2000. Oh, it was 2014. Great. Um, the, the idea was that from, from a design perspective, create design principles around this. And, and kind of, as Joachim Torström said it back in the 80s, um, the, modern, the hunger of the modern world may never leave you. And so we focused on what kind of products are, are there that we could actually use as fast fashion concepts um, that would be uh, party tops or sporting or wedding or, or traveling. But we, w the main thing we did here was we looked into the ecosystem of the forest and said, what would happen if we put the biosphere as a stakeholder at the table? And that kind of changes everything, all the models, all the you know, products. And it's really interesting from a designer perspective, because if you say that, OK, we have this uh, fiber that is good for us, but is it good for the biosphere? If it doesn't become like a, a, a value there, then it shouldn't exist. 
There's a, a, a guy named Ron Adler who's written a book called The Wide Lens, where he has a, just a good idea to, to visualize innovation. He does like a circular with the stakeholders and just put out all the stakeholders and give them plus. If there's one minus there, the invention, invention won't happen. So with five plus here, one minus, it won't happen because that stakeholder doesn't uh, put his uh, uh, effort into it. There's no, not enough value for him or her. But if we give a couple of plus to this stakeholder, that would be the biosphere, then it happens. So I think, uh, so that was really, we had that as a, as a um, design principle for this. Uh, and it was, this is, it's, it's the idea of stream materia that is a textile or garments that are designed to dye, meaning they are compostable, have a limited lifespan, are printed on demand, and uh, that you can consume almost whenever you like and consume whatever you want, embrace fashion, identity, etc. And it won't have any impact on the planet. Uh, there's a, a lot more to say about that. We don't have time. I'll get back to some of it. Uh, after we published this one, I was approached by a lot of people and they said, where is this material? Can we try it? Can we get it? I was going like, no, this is like a vision. This is an idea. This is a conceptual art idea about what we need, how we need to rethink what we do. We were then approached by Inventia guys who said that uh, maybe we have this material. Listen, it might be exist. Uh, so we started the Vinova funded like uh, pre-study. In lab, we work with micro, uh, mycelium and bacteria and stuff. They didn't have it, it turned out, but we started the first iteration we see down here to the right, with which was a 3D printed filament inspired, like a mesh structure inspired by uh, the leaf, the capillary systems of a leaf, and we covered it with a tissue of bioplastic and um, foam cellulose. And this material, uh, we experienced a lot. It's, it's made from re residue streams from the food industry. So it contains protein, uh, vit oh, not so much vitamins, proteins, um, alcohols, and fat, mainly. Uh, and we thought, what the hell? Let's try it. Let's try to do this in real life and see where it goes. So we, we kept doing it like an experience. Uh, see, can we do it wearable? Uh, what, what, it was m more or less like a fashion story in real life for me. So we, we just explored it and see how far we could go. A year later, we did this, uh, we made it wearable. It was st still like um, more an art product. Uh, it was stiff but it and it looked like it was dying already. It was great for the story. Uh, but we also, um, uh, we also discovered, because we had this silver bullet or missing link about what's, how is this going to be besides an idea, a value for the, for the, for the biosphere, like in the afterlife, a, a, a climate neutral process. Uh, and we asked the RISE and the SLU, that would be uh, Swedish University of Agriculture, what would happen if we scaled up the compostable, bio, uh, compostable food waste from um, the household industry 10 times. And they were going like, that would be great. Because now we don't have enough compostable material to make biogas a competitive industry within transportation. Uh, so we made, made biogas uh, tests, biomethane potential tests, and it turned out that since it was made out of basically food uh, and cellulose and water, it had the same biogas potential as food, which was great. Uh, and now that we see like trains in, in Germany being run by hydrogen gas, which is made out of natural or biogas, uh, it's really interesting to see what, what's the market's going like. So what we did here was that we, we, we connected fashion, like the idea, connect fashion industry with uh, biogas energy recovery and thus uh, creating like a perfect storm with these two maybe not so expected industries to co-work in, in order to create this ecosystem with no waste, with no impact on the climate. Uh, here we also, uh, I, the idea with this was to create uh, something, a, a material that was more like what you're feeling now, 
It was consumed like you consume food, something that needs to be consumed fresh, that you never can own, but you can experience. And the idea was also formulated that looking into what's happening to experience industry with uh, Spotify, uh, HBO, or Steam with the games, we used to own our products, but then we now we have a subscription on them, or we just get them streamed to us. Uh, and this would be really interesting to see if we could consume also our garments in this way, that we have a subscription or whatever. We, we, we did the garments uh, vir like virtually 3D already. So if you had your subscription, you could just order them whenever you want, whatever you want, uh, and that it got to you, and you had to experience like a rental car in the driveway on your holiday. Uh, you have to use it now or it's gone. So, uh, oh, sorry, this, uh, the f this picture were basically a lot of iterations we did during four years, making the, the, the garments more and more wearable. Um, the second finding we did, and this number two is, uh, is more or less showing you guys about the um, about to happen. We're we're making up making this up as we go because we have no choice. We're like on the train, uh, so we, from a design perspective, we need to f uh, always have the bi uh, biosphere as a stakeholder and then trying to meet that challenge with every change we make. And since the products are volatile, they're here, but now they have to challenge the notion of quality of the consumer. So we need to find new values with the garments to say, this is better than owning this one in the wardrobe. Okay, we were still not there, but then we found we had the biogas, okay, we had the ecosystem, but then we found that we could, we built this 3D printer, and now we could mass uh, customize, mass produce the garments in a mass custom customized way, sort of. Uh, that means that we could set up, uh, say, a uh, 3D printing unit in New York and print a part address uh, at Fifth Avenue, or we could set up a print 3D printing pop-up unit at New York Marathon and print 10,000 tops uh, to meet uh, the otherwise 10,000 tops of polyester um, being used just once at that race. Here we could just set them up and you can have your name, your number, whatever, printed on demand right there and then throw them in the... In the, in the in a container going straight to biogas digestion. 2020, we did a collab with uh, Puma Innovation, and we were to do there. We, we did a couple of running singlets, and we started looking into sports. Also, having the idea of, of disposable garments, single use garments. Uh, we were to do there a pavilion for the Milan Design Week, Design Week 2020. And we all know what happened in Milan 2020 in April. So this didn't happen physically. It happened virtually or digitally as a digital um, uh, communication concept. Uh, but we, during, just before that, we found something we call biofunctions. Because the, the models or the, the people trying their garments on, they said they were like, we asked, how does it feel? How does it feel? And they go like, it's kind of cooling you. So we found that it's, it contains glycerol which attracts water. And it's not full, so it's about 70% full. So during a couple of, uh, if you sweat, it cools you down. So you get a, a, like a biothermal function. So now it turned out from being just a garment to a functional garment with unexpected value we found because we made it up as we go. Uh, so that was super interesting to see how, okay, we, 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 um, we get a cooling function. We also found that we could, uh, we can add skin absorbing products like uh, nicotine, estrogen, uh, taurine, uh, vitamins, everything that you can absorb through the skin, mainly here behind the shoulders because that's where it tears more, most or rubs most. The friction is highest there. We could add them also mass customize since we 3D print them uniquely for every user uh, to, be, uh, to be added, maybe during a race or whatever, during training. We can also add scent to it. So now it turns out, what is this product? Is it just a garment or is it like a vitamin carrier or um, cooling you or whatever? So we, we, we started to find all those kind of values also. So then we're up to speed with where we are now. Now we can print them without the PLA mesh. We can do single one-offs. Uh, and these are mainly the, the, the um, products we're focusing on because these are 
markets that are growing and are super unsustainable, like traveling to, I mean, there are a lot of figures about how much people spend on their travels and so on, or party tops. Uh, we also do something called Design to Dye Leather, together with Deadwood Leather Jackets. These are much sturdier and harder and heavier than the other ones we saw before. It's more like an oak tree in the forest. It still has contained the nutrition, because that's a key issue for us, that the material that we use must carry the nutrition the value for the ecosystem, so it can become raw material for new resources, not only for humanity, but for the planet. Um, and um, one last finding we did, since we did uh, the material in 3D printed from the beginning, there is not, we, we, we do everything in, in, in 3D and in Clue 3D, which is a digital um, design program for garments. And since we're doing that already, we can just make the garments in virtual space. We can send it to strictly straight to print, printing. This means that we can also have our garments in games or in platform, meeting platforms or in Decentraland or what have you. And then directly take the garments out from there with a button or whatever, and you get your outfit f straight away, since it's 3D printed. And Let's see here, yes. There is a saying called mono no avare in um, Japan. And it, it, it means something like uh, the passing of time or the sadness of things. And this we have worked a lot with as a design inspiration. And it's, it, it, you, can, you can compare it with if you walk alone in the forest in the autumn and the leaves are turning yellow or red and you're feeling sad and lonely. And that is you actually feeling the passing of time. And I think that we really need to leave the linear thinking behind and start embracing the fact that we are part of a circular system, that we are living and dying, and everything around us is doing the same. So, thank you for listening. Thank you. Stick around. Just a couple of uh, finishing questions. Thank you so much, Eric, for this inspiring talk. Um, from a leaf you stepped on uh, into all these projects that you've created. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you really represent, uh, you know, having bold thinking to create brand new things that didn't exist before. Do you have any you know, advice to companies who want to perhaps, you know, step out of their box and try to find new solutions or new ways of thinking? How do you, how do you advise companies in doing so? Yeah, it's, as I said, <clears throat> I think it's really important to go straight down to the design phase and not and leave the old thinking and be bold enough not to think in old, I know this, that's where I'm going to uh, be active. Uh, because what, we, what we're doing, this is not the only thing we're doing, of course, but in this the, the stream materia project is probably has sold about 13,000 hours of, of time, uh, work time. We are, we, we don't know what we're doing. Nobody knows. Nobody can tell me, you can't do that. Because I, I can ask, have you tried? And nobody can say, yeah, we tried that back in the 80s. Nobody can say, we have tried. So that is super, so this is uncharted territory. It's like Narnia, you can go in there and, and it's like dangerous animals, everything is upside down, you don't understand the language, but that's kind of so fascinating, so you can't go back. And I think that's super important to dare. And it's hard if you have like a huge company and you have a lot of stake shareholders and you have Q3 deliverables. I don't. So leave that behind, I would say. Wonderful. Okay, Eric Lindvall, founder of Gringo, thank you so much. Thank you very much.